so yeah, so as I uh, noted in the first lecture, uh, and which he just mentioned as well, is the materials I'm going to be presenting today is part of uh, this co-author manuscript with Richard Soule from Queen Mary University. Uh, it is very much still a work, uh, uh, a working draft, all right? It's an ongoing project. So if anyone has any comments uh, after the lecture, I'd love to hear them, because uh, uh, this needs to be improved. I've got to get it better, <laughs> okay? So in yesterday's lecture, I focused on developments within Western Europe during the early post-war period. And in particular, I examined, as the title of the book might uh, indicate, I, I was looking at the continuing presence and significance of the far right in a number of key Western European states, okay, a number of key Western European states that were part of the development of this liberal international order, this what many scholars call the US-led liberal international order. And I was trying to tease out the ways in which these far right agents actually contributed to the development and evolution of this order. And today I'm going to be turning to the U.S. context. And specifically, I'm going to be drawing attention to the racialized foundations of American anti-communist ideologies and discourses that became a central, if highly contradictory, pillar of U.S. hegemony. And I'm going to explore the ways in which uh, American anti-communism from its very inception was permeated and infused with these deeply racist undertones associated with far-right political currents social forces. All right, so as I, as, I, as I want to show is that we need to look at American anti-communism as a distinctly racial practice, all right, a distinctly racial practice, one that was embedded within a constitutive of this broader emerging common sense, uh, 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 anti-communist common sense defined by a militant normative Americanism and a very particular conception of what it means to be an American. All right, and moreover, this racialized anti-communist consensus that emerges in the post-war uh, uh, period, I'm going to argue that it has, has very deep roots in American culture. And I'm going to, in particular, I'm going to be looking at this interwar period, okay, this interwar period, the, uh, the period between about 1919, 1918 to 1939. Uh, uh, and in a, in a certain way, the title of the book which you'd be expecting, I'm going to be talking about the Cold War period. We normally think of the post-war period, the post-1945 period. But one of the key arguments uh, in the manuscript is that we need to be looking at the Cold War in this longer time frame. Okay, the Cold War being uh, started in 1918, 1919 with the first Red Scare, with the beginning of the Bolshevik Revolution, and extending past uh, into, uh, uh, past through the uh, interwar period and onward. Okay, and, there, and the reasons for this is that the ideological and ge geopolitical differences between these periods, right, between these two periods in regards to the communist uh, threat is more of one of degrees rather than kind. The, the only really compelling argument we can make for that there's such a distinct difference is simply a geopolitical one, that the Soviet Union was just such a greater geopolitical threat after the Second World War <coughs> that it wasn't during the interwar period. And I think uh, the works of Michael Carley, Sandra Halpert, and many others really make these points very well for this a much more continuity than difference. Furthermore, some of the key ideological features of anti-communism and the specific social forces behind it first take shape and insert themselves during this interwar period, right? And if we look at, uh, look at this at the level of the international, its relationship to uh, the development of a, a distinct international order, as many historians have noted, right, the type of U.S.-led liberal international order that develops under Roosevelt and then Truman has its origins in the policies of Woodrow Wilson, right? So that's why they call it Wilsonian liberal internationalism. However, a bit less noted, is this intersection of race and anti-communism and how important this racialized form of anti-communism was to these designs, right? to Wilson's designs for the making of this new liberal international order. So tracing some of these continuities and changes in US foreign policy between these two different periods of the Cold War, I believe is important to understanding the nature and evolving logic of the Cold War and its totality, all right? And again, this a central political ally, I'm going to argue, in this emergent domestic anti-communist coalition came from an unlikely source, came from the white southern political and economic elites that sought to preserve the prevailing segregated racial <coughs> order during the New Deal period when it began to become under attack or perceived like it might be coming under attack. 
right? So in defending white supremacy, these southern elites often supported and colluded with far-right lobby groups, business associations, and parapolitical civil society uh, organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. Right? I'm going to be focusing in, in particular, on one such uh, business association. All right? More importantly, perhaps, they also forged significant and mutually beneficial, beneficial relations with militant anti-communists of the North. Right? that cemented these broader class alliances that would be some, become so crucial during the McCarthy area much later. Right? So in this sense, the southern elites, these southern elites were crucial elements in the social forces that would come to make up what some neo ramshins have called the liberal internationalist historical bloc that spearheaded the outward expansion of U.S. global power. And in this sense, then, our argument is that the reproduction, reproduction and buttressing of white supremacy at home was for a time a crucial foundation for the establishment and expansion of U.S. liberal hegemony abroad. Right? And appreciating this distinctly racial component of the post-war domestic order and the political alliances that engendered illuminates a core contradiction at the heart of U.S. foreign policy throughout the Cold War. Right? That is to say, this complex interaction between U.S. policymakers strident attempts to build a kind of global, uh, multiracial, anti-communist alliance, right, abroad, kept on coming up against the limitations of the continued defense of white supremacy at home. Quite simply, it was an international embarrassment and uh, fed, anti uh, fed communist propaganda to have this segregated Jim Crow order. And this became increasingly more and more a problem throughout the 1950s and into, even into the 1960s after Jim Crow finally fell for U.S. foreign policy makers. I'm not going to be talking about that too much today, uh, but in the book, we, we, we demonstrate in some detail these kind of foreign policy ma maker discourses and the, the extent to which they recognize the problems with this, but at the same time realized or you know, felt that they couldn't do anything because it was such a core constituent of the domestic coalition, right? these southern white Democrats. Okay, so before I turn to uh, uh, the, the Cold War period itself and look at the history, I want to just spend a moment uh, uh, interrogating the conceptual and material apparatus of, of uh, what, what Du Bois called the global color line and the ways it intersected across many different Cold Wars. Okay, so the history of international relations is enveloped within a history of race. This is often forgotten the kind of traditional mainstream IR scholarship, IR being an acronym for the discipline of international relations, unfortunately my home discipline, right? Often forgotten. Right? So this might come as kind of no surprise to sociologists and historians, duh, right? But not a bit more significant, a bit more novel than I are, right? And when Du Bois penned his famous thesis on this problem of the color line at the dawn of the 20th century, white world supremacy had nearly reached its <coughs> end, right? 20 years later, approximately 20 years later, Du Bois would <coughs> revisit these statements in the pages of the Council on Foreign uh, Affairs, Council of International Affairs, the, its key uh, journal, the Foreign Affairs, right? And when he did so in 1925, the colonial order looked like it had lay just shaken, right? It had just come, uh, uh, it had just go through this world war. Global white supremacy was engulfed in this crisis as these as uh, anti-colonial re revolts were opening up, right? And the Reds in Petrograd had overthrown czarism and it inst instituted the first successful socialist-inspired revolution. And of course for Du Bois, colonialism, inter-imperial conflicts and war on the one side, and revolts against capitalism and the global white supremacy were inter interconnected world historical phenomena. Right? He didn't see any difference. They were, they were in integral to each other. Right? Obviously being a socialist, Marxist, civil rights advocate. Right? And what we see is that he saw the First World War as not an aberration from European civilization, but its highest and clearest expression. Right? So for colonial expansion, inter-imperial rivalries that engender, engendered were the very causes of the war itself, as he put it in a very famous thesis from uh, a 1915 article, The African Roots of War. And in his 1925 foreign affairs piece, Du Bois would thus pr propose that the present problem of problems, specifically the global structure of the exploitation of, of labor, needed to be rethought in, in terms of what he called the dark colonial shadow cast by the European empire. And what Du Bois examines here is how imperialism uh, wore a democratic face at home while turning, quote, a visible, 
of stern and unyielding autocracy towards its darker, darker colonies. And yet this denial of democracy in the colonies hindered its, its complete realization in the European metropole. And it is this, he wrote, that marks the color problem and the labor problem to so great an extent two sides of the same human tangle. Right? So again, these revolts against capital, right? the labor problem, and revolts against the color line, inseparable. With this said, it's then probably not very surprising that the Harvard-educated American, histori American historian and eugenicist Lothrop Stoddard would single out Du Bois' text as, quote, a dire warning about the rising tide of color and the possible end of white supremacy. And, of course, Du Bois and Stoddard would famously debate in 1927 and 1929. And perhaps it's also no coincidence, then, that Stoddard's best-selling polemic the Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy was published at the height of America's first Red Scare. It was published in 1920. For U.S. anti-communist practices and discourses were deeply embedded in this, this metaphysics and ontology of race. Right? So for, for Stoddard, this menace of Bolshevism, right? this menace of Bolshevism was conjured up as a frontal attack on the very foundations of white civilization. Bolshevism was admitted as envisaged as a peril without precedent in history. The effects of its so-called war on the classes, as he put it, was producing, producing incalculable racial impoverishment. And if the Bolsheviks were indeed successful in their war on the classes, it would, quote, uh, 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 civilization would wither like a plant stricken by blight, blight, while the race, similarly drained of its good blood, would sink like lead <coughs> into the depths of degenerate barbarism. So Bolshevism was seen as just as anti-racial as it was anti-social, as it exclaimed, quote, the very existence of superior bi biological values is a crime. Now Stoddard's nightmarish racial fantasy scape, right, linking communism to the degeneration of the white race, was not uncommon for its time. It might have been particularly colorful language, right? But what you find is that these racializations of the, of the communist threat, you find them throughout the highest echelons of U.S. foreign policymaker, right from uh, Woodrow Wilson to his second secretary of state, Robert Lansing, down to later director of Hoover, uh, uh, FBI uh, director Herbert Hoover, to the so-called Cold War <coughs> containment architect, George F. Kennedy. Right? These racial, anti-communist assumptions and practices are suffusing the American state from this kind of classical period of the close war. So if the history of international relation is enveloped in a history of race, so too then is the history of anti-communism. Right? The, global, the global color line would come to, to cut across and divide against this Cold War. And to make full sense of the racial ordering of these geopolitics of the Cold War, it's also necessary to punctuate and problematize the very conceptual coherence of anti-war, uh, Cold War communism, uh, Cold War anti-communism itself. Simply put, the Cold War was never, never univocal, right? Processes subsumed under these master categories of the Cold War and anti-communism encompass an array of different social, cultural, and geopolitical phenomena. And this is even so when we restrict our analysis simply to the U.S. context. So we can see, and what we try to argue and demonstrate in the book, is that the Cold War is differentially articulated across a vast expanse of different social spaces. And this imbues it with distinct logics and ideopolitical imaginaries in these different places and times. So for example, the further you, you the kind of the further you look away from the European kind of Cold War, the kind of center of the Cold War, your, uh, Cold War geopolitics, the hotter the conflicts actually become, and the more racialized they become as well. You see in the so-called periphery, the Western powers engaged in a series of race wars against peoples that they, they view as developmentally backward and racially inferior. Development being often cast in this racialized terms. And it, you also see that anti communist practices and discourses are fundamentally multivalent, right? So the racial dynamics being most pronounced in those former white settler colony and contexts such as Australia, South Africa, and the United States, the latter of which we'll be discussing today. All right, so I'm going to now focus on this opening salvo. Of, uh, of Cold War anti-communism, inaugurated by the Bolshevik Revolution and the resulting Red Scare. Okay, <coughs> so at the height of the first Red Scare in the summer of 1919, 
The headlines of the New York Times, among many other papers, were awash with these vivid and terrifying details of this murderous dictatorship, right? This murderous, barbaric uh, dictatorship. In fact, one of the things I couldn't find, but there's a September article called A Government of Murder. So literally, murderous dictatorship, right? So this is from a J uh, July 1st, 1919 issue. There's another one a couple weeks before that. Thug with a rifle, Russia's new czar, refugees tells of murder and robbery under Bolshevik eye, rule of crim criminals, bourgeois bur bourgeoisie burned alive, right? And these kind of sordid and often embellished tales from the newspaper of record, again, were far from unusual, right? And even at the time of their appearance, you had very well-respected journalists pointing out that they were, for the most part, false. So Lip uh, Lipman and Charles Mertz writes, uh, and demonstrate in their famous uh, and influential study of 1920 20, that the Times' coverage of the Bolshevik Revolution was guilty of systematically biased and incomplete reporting revealed by a pattern of misstatements and misinformation. But much less commented upon and much less disturbing to these intellectual elites was, the, uh, was this often repeated conjecture of a so-called red and black conspiracy. Right? The idea that foreign communists and outside agitator were the causes of much of the racial strife of the period. For we have to remember that the summer of the Red Summer of 1919 was also a period that saw some of the most violent and widespread uh, so-called race riots in American history. So in August 1919, front page headline of the New York Times read, Radicals Inciting Negroes to Violence. In the same month, the Wall Street Journal would write, Quote, race riots that seem to have their genesis, a Bolshevist, a Negro, and a gun. And this was commonplace. You see this again and again. Right? So as we can see here, that even among the more liberal press outlets, right, in the popular kind of public sphere, racializations of the communist threat ran deep and wide. It was not merely a southern phenomenon, and it was certainly not only connected to the fringe elements of the far right. And what we try to show in the book is that how the emergence of this anti-communist, racialized communist sense has deep roots in American state society relations and American culture, particularly as it was shaped from the long history of American frontier and expansion and what Richard Slotkin calls the wars against racial primitive enemies. And it's this originating racial primitive enemy, that is the Native Americans, that Joel uh, Colville sig signals out as the object of the first, quote, Red Scare and the primal communist of American history. Right? So originating in this context, right, this frontier encounter crystallizes into a myth of regeneration through violence. It provides a key ideological imaginary shaping the interconnected development of American state society relations, foreign policy, and an expanding capitalist economy. And it's these wars against the American Indians that offered, quote, and I'm quoting Slotkin here, a symbolo symbolic surrogate for a range of domestic, social, and political conflicts. It was a way of redirecting class and social conflicts outwards and diffusing these conflicts. Right? So if we have to remember that for the Puritan settlers, right, this absence of individuated property rights and commercial exchange rate relations not only defined the American Indians as different, Right, as, as constituted by different social structures as others, they also constituted them as social non-beings, right? denying them sovereign agency, thus being able to dispossess their lands. It was absolutely central, this othering process, to this longer history of primitive accumulation in the U.S. Uh, uh, frontier encounter. And like the enslaved Africans before them, or not before them, excuse me, brought to the Americas, excuse me, the American Indians were symbols of social disorder and radical alterity that needed to be controlled and fought by concentrated state force and terror. And we see the same kind of pattern later going on in how they deal with the racialized anti-communist enemy. So the argument is, is that this historical repression of American Indians and other non-whites were integral to the formation of the ideological apparatus of white, uh, of white American supremacy, exceptionalism and nativism that would later define the American far right, but that in the crucial moment of the emergence of this racialized anti-communism were key characteristics of mainstream American popular culture. Right, so the making of American anti-communism into a classical kind of post-1945 phase was thus already, always already imbued with distinctly racial and foreign significations bound to the specificities of the inter-societal development of the American state inter-societal in the sense that they were uh, interacting with these different types of societies, Native American, 
Now, if we look at a kind of shorter time period, we see that the red, the red Scare of 1919 signaled this culmination <coughs> of about a half century of growing class and ethnic conflicts, right? So during this period, in, uh, during this period over this kind of last half century, American society is rapidly transformed by the interconnected processes of rapid industrialization, urbanization, and immigration. And it's these sociological contradictions emerging from what uh, Trotsky termed the uneven and combined development of American capitalism that were so destabilized in the social and racial order. So much so that uh, many, excuse me, U.S. elites feared a popular insurrection fomented and controlled by foreign revolutionaries. I'm quoting here from a newspaper. Right, so this, these intermittent class and racial struggles are consequently enveloped within a nativist-inspired racial anxiety. Right? But what then distinguishes the first great Red Scare from these prior events, right? These prior, the, you know, think of the Paris Commune, the 1877 uh, uh, Haymarket, right? What, 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 what distinguishes it? Obviously, the novelty of the world's first communist-inspired, right, ex explicitly self-proclaimed communist state, right? One found no less in the so-called half-Asiatic, backward Russian state. Right? So it seems that America's worst nightmares, the American elite's worst nightmares of a worldwide foreign conspiracy of alien radical subversion had su suddenly come true. Right? And like the Native Americans, the threat was met with the concentrated force of the American state. But unlike the Native Americans, the communist, men extended, the communist menace, menace extended beyond the American state, beyond the domestic context, and moved to threaten the entire world order, world order and thus possibly the foundations of white world supremacy. And it's crucially in response to facing off these geopolitical, these international challenges of Bolshevism that Wilson, Wilsonian liberal internationalism is really first begins to crystallize. So we see on the home front during this first red, uh, first, uh, red scare, we see the Wilson administration responding by a vast campaign of political repression, censorship, and terror against pretty much all suspected leftists, so-called foreign subversives, or radicalized minorities. Right? And again, the dominant tenure of this anti-communist onslaught is nativist-inspired and racially inflected. This is a response to these widespread fears that Bolsheviks' ideas were disproportionately spreading through the US, through the United States, through the conveyor belt of foreign and non-white elements. Right? So we see, for example, the Sedition Act of May 1918 that's uh, wielded to target aliens and silence radical pol political opposition of almost any strike to the war. To the war. Similarly, you see the uh, Palmer Raids of December 1919 that lead to the arrest and deportation of over 600 foreign-born radicals that weren't actually that radical, many of them. You also see Hoover sounding the alarm in his new position at the FBI, charging communists with, quote, having done a vast amount of evil damage by carrying the doctrines of race revolt and the poison of Bolshevism to the Negroes. You have the Lust Commission, again, pointing to the Jewish, the Jewish origins of Bolshevism. Uh, all these different racializations of, common, of the communist threat. And you see President Wilson himself is, uh, expressing very similar views regarding the Bolshevism's foreign influence and potentials for sparking uh, uh, what he called immigrant radicalism and revolutionary tendencies among African Americans. He was very quick to label any dissent, especially from ethnic minorities, right, as Bolshevistically inclined. And as well, it's well known now that, you know, Wilson was a typical white supremacist, right, old school Democrat, right, who made no bones about his belief in the absolute superiority of the Anglo-Saxon race. You know, racial hierarchy and what uh, John Hobson has called Eurocentric paternalism were among the most important features guiding you, uh, 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 Wilson's ideology and his foreign policy. You know, for Wilson, blacks were inferior, <coughs> non-white societies too backward, yet to achieve self-government. Right? So for Wilson, national determination was only meant for whites. Right? It was, in a sense, a privilege of whiteness. Now we see these two integral elements of racial hierarchy and white supremacy being embedded in Wilson thought, and it's this type of thinking that guides Wilson's designs in building a new liberal international order at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. And there you see, he really is trying to stave off these twin threats of the Bolsheviks 
and these anti-communist, or anti, excuse me, colonial uprisings, right? And he sees these two threats as inextricably conjoined, right? The Bolsheviks are not only challenging the liberal capitalist order that he's propounding, right, but also the white world supremacy enshrined within, right? We have to recall that it's under pressure from the Bolshevik Petrograd that the Russian provisional government is the first among the belligerents during First World War to call for the self-determination of peoples as the fundamental basis of any peace treaty. It's not Wilson, as is commonly referred to in the literature, right? or at least in the international relations, the political science literature. And once in power, it's the Bolsheviks that continue such demands for self-determination, not only for the ex-Habsburg uh, states, right? they're calling for self-determination in the colon colonies. Right? But at Versailles, the slogan of national self-determination initially formulated in these socialist and anti-colonial discourses undergo a fundamental change right, at the hands of Wilson. Right? It now becomes a means to preserve the system, not to threaten that system. Right? As uh, Ezra uh, Manel puts it, a bulwark against radical revolutionary challenges to existing orders. And those two existing orders being the capitalist imperialist system that uh, Lenin, the Bolsheviks identified, and White's world supremacy. And in these ways, we try to conceptualize Wilson's foreign policy as a type of attempted geopolitical management of uneven and combined development. An uneven and combined development that produces these twin threats of anti-colonial revolutionaries and Bolshevism. Right? So Wilson's liberal internationalism was, in short, a form of counter-revolutionary or counter-subversive racial practice. It aimed to eventually uh, manage, or excuse me, to manage and eventually roll back the communist-inspired and anti-colonial revolutionary movements. And it re logically re uh, relied upon, as Richard Seymour has shown, upon the traditional racist means of such management. What it also did, what it also entailed, was the strategic will wielding of far-right social forces as bulwarks against Bolshevism. And we'll see this as a kind of recurrent theme throughout the 1920s, throughout the 1930s, with the rise of the fascist and Nazi powers, right? So this is demonstrated above all by Wilson's, uh, uh, the Wilson administration's covert military and financial aid to the reactionary white forces in South Russia during the Civil War. There, they knew, the, the, the Wilson administration knew that these guys, these, and they were mostly guys, I should say, but these people, right, these forces were far-right reactionary that were looking to establish a military and authoritarian dictatorship and did so in horribly violent ways in, in fighting the Bolsheviks. Right, so, now as we see, obviously Wilson's attempt at establishing this liberal international order is unsuccessful, right? And it's taken, it takes later generations of administrations, particularly the Truman and, uh, 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 excuse me, the Roosevelt and Truman administration, to establish this, this uh, U.S.-led uh, geopolitical order. But the key point that we're trying to make is that this order is already imbued with these racial and anti-communist tendencies, and these tendencies play out furthermore, right, in these later uh, iterations of this order and that they find an elective affinity with the forces of the far right. Okay, so, good on time, good. So we see that in the 1920s, this kind of hyper anti-communist hysteria begins to subside. And there's a kind of return to normalcy to a certain extent. However, this rightward shift in American culture, American politics, remains. And, and, and so is this racialization of the communist threat and the nativist and white supremacist imaginaries embedded with it. Right? So we still see this kind of nascent, emergent, anti-communist uh, uh, common sense there. And these trends continue, uh, uh, particularly in the New Deal period, within the traditional stronghold of the Democratic Party, that is, that of the South. Right? And what we see here is that the politics of Roosevelt's New Deal right, are wrapped within what, what uh, Ira Katz and Nelson calls the Southern Cage. Right? And, and actually, when he's talking about the Southern Cage, he's not just talking about a cage in the sense of limiting the more progressive agendas right, of the New Deal politics. Right? It's much more than that. Right? Because what emerges in the 1930s is an intimate partnership between New Deal reformers and Southern racial reactionaries. And this, this latter, this latter group forms the crucial part of the New Deal's what he calls supportive structure. Right? So the New Deal thus collaborated with the South racial hegemony, 
right? And did so even with its most notable and noble achievements, which stood on the shoulders of this southern bulwark. Now, less noted by Katz Nelson is that this southern bulwark is the most vocal and militant ally in this emerging anti-communist coalition, right? This emerging anti-communist coalition that becomes fundamental to the making of what the neo Gramscians call, as I mentioned before, the liberal internationalist historical bloc, right? So at, at home, these, this, this coalition that emerges out of the New Deal period is trying to build as broad a possible, like a broad ideologically based anti-communist coalition as possible, right? So it comes to incorporate the dominant factions of capital, uh, anti-communist labor unions, uh, uh, centrist political parties, which in the United States are basically both political parties, right? Uh, uh, and also leading civil society organizations. And so this, this domestic coalition of diverse social forces all right, comes to constitute the key social edifice upon which U.S. hegemony is built at home and U.S. imperialism expands abroad. All right? And here again, it's the ideological role of anti-communism that's so crucial because it acts as a kind of quilting point interconnecting American ideas of race and nationality into a single set of articulations. And here I'm drawing on Richard Seymour again. Right? And we show that in the manu and we show in the manuscript that how this, this South's hegemonic alliance of uh, industrial and planter interests right, come to be incorporated into this liberal internationalist uh, uh, bloc as subordinate pa partners during the New Deal period and after. Right? And they do so primarily through four, uh, four factors. Right? The first is these racially laden exclusions from the New Deal's economic policies on the Southern economy. We also see, and this is important for understanding the kind of the Gramscian sense of the historical bloc, right, this application of Fordist productive methods and scientific rationalization to the Southern economy in the 1930s and 1940s, right? The third point is the disproportionately uh, influential and politically useful role that the Southern politicians play in wielding these state uh, repressive apparatuses under McCarthyism and policing dissent at home. And fourthly, the ideologically militant anti-communism espoused by these Southern elites critically assist in bringing together these diverse social political forces into a single hegemonic bloc. Right, so the U.S. historical bloc, this key uh, 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 political alliance that we usually refer to as the vital center or the liberal internationalists, right, actually includes some of the most racially reactionary and far far-right forces in the entire American civil generation. It essentially rests on a grand strategic bargain with an entire region committed to the preservation of systematized white supremacy. Right? And during the 1930s, we see how Southern elites interlacing of anti-communism and white supremacy is all pervasive, and that this becomes a hallmark and a kind of a model for the types of massive resistance campaigns uh, uh, against the civil rights movements of the late 1950s and early 1960s, right? So the key argument that we're trying to make that we demonstrate in the book is that these anti-communist co coalitions and their dominating ideological uh, tropes first uh, uh, emerge in the interwar period and particularly this 1930s period of the New Deal, right? And here, of course, it's important to recall that the distinguishing feature of the political economy of the South was that it was this contradictory kind of uh, ridden reproduction of the social order that's fundamentally premised on this explicitly racialized system of labor relations, right? So this system is fundamental to both the ideological and material apparatuses of ruling class power in the South, right? Any threat to its existence is a threat to its entire social structure. And this kind of gives you an idea of why there would be this kind of structural interconnection between any threats i.e. any kind of desegregation movement, being painted then as a movement against capitalism, right? It, they, they honestly believed it, I think, many of these people, while other people just kind of, kind of used it uh, as a strategic rhetoric. But either way, that's, that I give some clues into why these uh, movements were so easily painted as communist uh, or socialist threat. So the argument then is that Southern white supremacy is not simply an ideology political preference, right? It's an assemblage of social relations, of oppression and domination that are integral to the structuration of a particular form of exploitation, right? So it operated as a system of organized racism directly implicated in what Marx called the specific form in which unpaid uh, surplus labor is pumped out of the direct producer. 
right? It collapses in fundamental ways this kind of metaphorical distinction between superstructure and base. And in this respect, Jim Crow capitalist modernity shared broadly similar structural characteristics with the European colonies, right? Particularly when, when Franz Fanon observed there that the economic substructure is also a superstructure, and for that matter, the superstructure is also a substructure, right? So the argument is that the ideological and coercive apparatus of Southern white power was enshrined in this particularly virulent and highly articulated form of racial capitalism. Or more specifically, as Seymour puts it, the Southern formation represented a particular pathology of racial capitalism that, while functional in various ways, was no longer necessary for its successful reproduction once technological advances allowed for the effective subsumption of labor process by the 1940s. Bit of a mouthful, right? This is this process of Fortis, the application of mass Fortis uh, and scientific rationalization. And indeed, some of the more prescient Southern elites of the time did realize right, quite quickly that the federal interventionism of Roosevelt's New Deal and the socioeconomic uh, uh, transformations that were unleashing it had the potential to threaten their apparatus of white power. Right? And the one group we look at in particular uh, is the Southern States Industrial Council. Right? So, this was a group founded in 1933 over some kind of arcane wage differential policies about the application of these economic policies, the New Deal economic policies in the South. It was a kind of uh, meeting point for all the major industrial, commercial, and also large-scale agricultural interests uh, of the South. And as we show, drawing on some, uh, uh, some wonderful archival materials that we stumbled upon, it was very important in its lobbying activities in protecting the South from the more radical uh, uh, aspects of the New Deal, and particularly in protecting the South's uh, specific uh, set of relations, this racialized system of labor relations. Right? It was very successful. However, after the war, right, the, the, the CCIS becomes much more radical in their ideological outlook and much less successful in their policy outcomes. Well, we argue that these failures of the later kind of uh, iteration of the SSIC are very much productive failures. <coughs> productive failures in the sense that their political interventions affect important ideological shifts and bridge, build, and, and, and bridge building uh, maneuvers with more conservative Republicans and their more laissez-faire uh, ideas about capitalism. And this lays the bridge to the later neoliberal assault of the uh, 1980s period of the Cold War. Now, we talk about that a bit in the book, but for here, the more important part is the way in which uh, the CCIS played a role as this institutional nexus, right? Partially uniting these various and disparate factions of Southern capital together. And they do so in a way that they're able to then coordinate their efforts to better defend Jim Crow's racial order and to paint any external challenges or any, any challenges to that order as emanating from either external communist forces from below, below or socialist intervention from the federal government. Right? So in these endeavors, the SSC espouses far-right ideas that were virulently anti-union, anti-federal government, <coughs> anti-communist. And they melded the southern ruling class's traditional defense of white supremacy with an unbridled defense of free market capitalism in ways that, as Ward, uh, uh, Jason Ward here puts, opened up lines of communication with like-minded allies across the country. And it's this contribution <coughs> that they make to the formation of the kind of ultra-right anti-communist alliances that eventually lead to the national hysteria, or contribute, I should say, to the national hysteria of the Second Red Scare period. Right? They play a really important role in that way. In fact, some of the Texans that are involved in funding McCarthy are members of the SSIC. Hmm. Right? So this has important consequences for the kind of anti-communist political order that's established in the domestic sphere. And when we take the SSIC's activities alongside the broader array of far-right forces in the post-war period, right, we also find some important effects on U.S. foreign policymaking. Right? So we see uh, in the crucial period of the late 1940s, with U.S.-Soviet uh, relations deteriorating, these militant anti-communist forces are the ones contributing to this more general rightward lurch in U.S. foreign policymaking, in particular the attempts to roll back communism in Korea. Right? So there's really some wonderful, interesting personnel links between this group, various other far-right groups, and, and the account that Bruce Cummings gives of the kind of rollback contingent in the Korean War. Right? And they also, uh, as I've been hammering home, they contribute to this consolidation of this racially laden, anti-communist popular sense defined by a militant, normative Americanism. 
right? And this far right inflected uh, populist militism, militarism, as uh, Mark Rupert puts it, is fundamental to policing dissent at home and projecting U.S. imperialism abroad during the Cold, year, Cold War years. And so, in this way, uh, in these ways, we argue that far right forces played a crucial, if often concealed, role in producing and reproducing U.S. hegemony during the Cold War. But, as we're seeing today, they possibly might be also playing a role in its imminent decline. Okay, thank you. I'm going to stop there.